thank you. Uh, I want first to acknowledge my two PhD students who did most of the work. I want so also to acknowledge my first PhD student, Beck Blocken, and Beck Blocken is also my link to Ted, because Ted said to me this morning that he had a very good student in 99 when he was on sabbatical here in Eindhoven, and that's where Bert went from Leuven to Eindhoven to follow wind course, because there was, in Leuven, in Belgium, there was no, no courses on wind. So that's how our collaboration started. And then Bert went on postdoc to TED in Montreal, and then he wrote, wrote a paper out of his PhD, and he asked me, do you want to be co-author? I said, yeah. Maybe yes, yeah, why not? So this was a paper of Ted with Bert, and this became, for Bert, I'm sure, his most cited paper. I don't know for Ted, probably yes. For me, yes, it's my most cited paper. So that's why I have to thank twice uh, Ted and Bert. I will talk about uh, wind-driven rain research. Uh, maybe you think that in Switzerland everything is okay. That's not true. As you see here, you have a design of a 40 million Swiss francs, that's the same now as an euro, of this construction, right? Uh, and there were a lot of complaints, and one of the complaints is that wherever you stay, you always get wet. Now, this is also the station where I go every day, and it's true. Uh, when it's sunny, there's not enough shadow. When it's raining, there's everywhere rain, and it's very windy. So I will show you that um, at this stage now we have models that we can also um, design those constructions. Um, this is in Locarno, that is also in Switzerland, and uh, suddenly they have a lot of flooding, and this is due to climatic change. Now here the Stuber system was designed not taking into account climatic change. So it means that we have to redesign a lot of systems. And for that we have also to have a very good rain prediction. And finally there was in 2014 um, a, a landslide and this landslide hit this train. Of course it was a train coming by that was vibrating and by that you had a landslide. But the real reason was that there were very heavy rains of 50 to 60 uh, liters, and that made that this slope became unstable. So also we have to be able to predict uh, rain not only on buildings but also on um, other constructions and also on uh, slopes. So this is my introduction. So we need a computational model, uh, method that can be used by engineers and that can be able to predict wind around buildings, but also the rain, and the rain deposition, not only on one specific place, but on all horizontal places and also around this tower. Uh, the classical method that was initiated by Choi and then uh, Bert worked further on this, uh, is based on Lagrangian particle tra tracking. Uh, what we do is we do first uh, a wind calculation using runs, and then you can prove that if you leave particles and they, co they hit this building, that you can easily calculate the catch ratio, which is the ratio between the distance here and the distance there, and that gives here the ratio between the wind-driven rain and the horizontal. Horizontal means not horizontal rain, but going, rain going through a horizontal surface. So this is measured. And this we calculate, and the ratio between the two, that's what we want to know. And here you see such a calculation. Now, the problem with uh, particle tracking is that you have a shower here, somewhere in your computer, and those particles have to hit this building. And this you don't know, where you have to put those particles, and it depends also on the size and everything. So this is quite uh, extensive work, and somewhere work by hand. Uh, you see here also some simulations that Berg did in 2006 uh, on slopes, so it's also possible there. But we want to have a much more powerful method. And that's the Eulerian multiphase method that I want to present now. What we do first is we, we take the distribution and we divide the distribution. So here you have the uh, frequency, here you have the rain diameter of your droplet. We separate it in different phases. 
And then we apply continuity equation, as you see here, and we also apply the momentum equation. And in the momentum equation, you see here alpha, which is the phase fraction of the rain phase, specific for one droplet size. You see here the convective transport, the turbulent transport. I will come back to that later. And at the right-hand side, you have the driving forces, the gravita gravitation, and the drag force, where you see here the difference between the speed of the air phase, what we calculated before, and the speed of the rain phase. Um, this method is very powerful. I don't go into the details, but it allows you to solve the complete domain. So you get the rain everywhere, at every point. So you get the rain, as you see here, on those cubes, on those two buildings. You see also the rain at the backside. You see if the wind comes from an angle that you have uh, the information of where the rain comes. And this is, of course, information we also need if we want to design sewer systems or uh, other uh, related subjects. Uh, here I come back to the railway and the tram station. So this is here the tram station. Of course, we only simulated the roofs. We did not simulate the support. And you see here how powerful this method is. This is for a rain droplet diameter of 0.5. These are the streamlines. Um, the blue means that there's uh, no rain, so that is good. But you see there are some problems here. It's coming some rain. Uh, and that's what you experience if you walk there and when there's rain. Um, here you see from top. and especially here, white areas are dry, all the other areas receive rain. So if you walk, for instance, I get here out of my tram and I have to take my train there. If I walk from here to there, I get quite some rain. So you have to go in another way. So this shows really that this method is quite powerful also in designing real uh, structures. Uh, here you see another example. Here we were interested in some facade details. Um, you see here the balconies, the sheltering of the balconies. The balconies, of course, receive a lot of rain. This is, again, the catch ratio. You see here also very little details. And you see that uh, there's some kind of shadowing effect. If you have to do this with Lagrangian and particle tracking, you have to find a, a position here that hits this little detail. That's almost impossible. So you see that with this method, you get quite some good results. One of the questions we had since we started from 2000 until 2014, the question we got in every paper was, what about turbulent rain dispersion? How important is that? And uh, Fabian van Moog, who is here in the room, who was a PhD student uh, here in Eindhoven, he said, well, I can solve this in Lagrangian particle tracking by giving some random trajectories. Um, now, in the method, the Eulerian method, you can introduce this much more easily. I go back to the momentum equation. You see here uh, the shear stresses. And this is the shear stresses of the rain phase. So you could develop a turbulence model for the rain phase, as we do for the air phase. This is a little bit difficult, and it's not very clear how to do it. So what people do, not in rain, but in other particle track, uh, um, where they're interested in particle transport, is they define a response coefficient, which gives, which relates the velocity variations of the rain phase to the velocity fluctuations of the air phase. And what you also can prove is that it relates the turbulent kinetic energy of the air phase to the rain phase. But you have to know this response coefficient, and you see the response coefficient is a function of the rain drop diameter, saying that a very little drop will follow all the fluctuations of the air, while heavy drops will be less influenced. So you have, of course, to know uh, those coefficients. And that's something that is based on measurements. You see it's related to kinetic, turbulent kinetic energy, so that means that you will have a lot of dispersion where you have a lot of where the Ka is very high, so where we have a lot of turbulent kinetic intensity. And here you see a plot, for instance, of uh, also uh, the response coefficients uh, around a building. So let's look at some results. So here you see without turbulent dispersion, here you see with turbulent dispersion. What is it, uh, an artifact in 
the, if you don't have turbulent dispersion is that you have droplets that really just go uh, along the wall. They will never hit. Of course, this is, seems not very realistic with taking into account turbulent dispersion. On the part, you see that now much more rain droplets will hit the building. And you see here also the contact angles with what they hit are less. Uh, this is the comparison with experimental values. Again, the tower. This was uh, without turbulent dispersion. This is with. And you see that now we are a little bit closer to the real values. You see that you get here, due to turbulent dispersion, quite a lot of rain, where the normal me method without uh, predicts less rain. So you get more rain here due to turbulent dis dispersion, something like 10% or more. One of the other questions we always get is what happens when the rain, when we, the wind is unsteady? Uh, what is the influence of this unsteadiness of the wind on the wind driven rain? Um, first I want to show you some uh, measurements we did in our wind tunnel. Uh, where we have a time resolved PIV system and now a movie should come. Yeah. So here you see the measurement um, and you see clearly the shear layer. Uh, you see also all the instabilities. You see also here the vortex in the, in the canyon. You see here some LAS simulations and you see also that very clearly there are coherent flow structures. Uh, which are here coming, and of course, if now a rain droplet comes here and goes through these coherent structures, of course, the rain will be influenced. And the question is, do we have to take this into account? Uh, another example here is uh, also measurements in the uh, street canyon, uh, where here you have acquired a boundary layer, which is laminar. Here we had a spire uh, increase in the turbulence, and here you have uh, a barrier also. And what you see is, of course, that here this, the turbulent kinetic energy is, of course, totally different. So also this person, everything will be different. And the question is, do we have to take that into account? Uh, we have, we see clearly in our measurements in the out of plane that we have structures, large scale structures, and we want to know what is the influence on that. A last image I uh, show is the analysis of those uh, flow fields uh, where we could identify a lot of vortices, vortex, uh, vortices, vortices, and what we found is that there are a lot of sweeps and ejections. So you have ejections of a lot of air, and you have sweeps in a hairpin vortex. So it's a, uh, you have rolling of air, then it lifts up, for, for, uh, forms a hairpin vortex, and you have those really big events here. And the question, of course, is what does it do? Uh, the nice thing with the method we developed, with the Eulerian method, is that you can do a LAS calculation and combine it with uh, the Eulerian multiphase model. And here you see uh, some events happening and what is the influence here on the droplets. So here you see it in 3D in the next movie. And you see, of course, there's quite some influence of this unsteadiness on this um, flow field, on this, uh, the streamlines. If you do a quantitative analysis, you see here the instantaneous catch ratios, they vary. And you see here two, two events where you have red lines. Um, this is for a droplet size of two millimeter. You see that the average is almost the same. So it varies a little bit, but finally the average predicted value is very good. So we don't need really to take into account this unsteadiness. Of course, this is for heavy particles, droplets, what happens with small ones? And small ones you see that, of course, they vary much, much more. But again, if you take the average and you compare that with the classical uh, uh, simulation, you get quite good predictions. So it means that we don't have really to consider that. We did also validation. I will not present here, but we find uh, something like a, a 2 to 10 percent uh, error. Uh, the model we, we developed is available in open form, uh, so people that want to do download it can uh, use that. Uh, last part, the last two minutes, three minutes, uh, I want to say something what we do once we have calculated the trajectories of the droplets, what happens when they hit a building. 
so what you can do is you can predict what is the impact speed. You see it goes up somewhere to two, three meters per second. That's typical for rain droplets hitting. And what is important is also the angle they hit the building. And here you have particles that hit the building at zero degrees, so it means they hit them this way, but a lot of them are very at a slope, and so you should take into account also that you have rain droplets hitting the surface at a slope. Um, we did quite some imaging of droplet impacts on pars media. Uh, it's quite complex, but what you can see is that if you say we stay below two meters per second, and we stay with droplets around two millimeter diameter, you can say that you have those effects, right? You have not to go to splashing. It's only in very heavy rain events where you have quite heavy droplets and also very high speeds, you have to take this into account. We did it on different materials, pars materials. Um, what you see is that here you have the spreading. We are mainly interested in the maximum spreading, how much a droplet will spread. What you see here, and I show it more in detail, is that the droplet is spreading at a contact angle higher than 90 degrees. If you remember your physics class, higher than 90 degrees means hydrophobic. Now, if you would just put a droplet on these sparse materials, it would spread. So it's totally wetting the contact angle uh, in equilibrium is around zero. So how come that we have a hydrophobic effect? This is because you have a very thin air layer under. So it impacts, there's this, a very thin uh, air layer that is spreading and makes that you have these uh, positive contact angles. You see it here uh, clearly, we have impact of two droplets. Um, one meter a second and two meters a second. You see that the diameter they are spreading is different, but you clearly see that they are hydrophobic for some time and then they become completely hydrophilic. We simulate that with uh, open foam again, uh, with the volume of fluid, and you see the comparisons between the simulations and experiments is quite good, so that means that uh, we can simulate that. Now, I have to say we have to measure the contact angle. The contact angle is input to the model, and that's the real problem. So if you don't know this contact angle, the dynamic one, which is also a function of the impact speed, you have a problem. Okay, I will skip this, but you can uh, look at different uh, liquids uh, and predict the maximum spreading, so you ha we have simple models that can predict that. Uh, finally, to finish, we also do some imaging uh, with neutrons where we can also see what is happening in the substrate. And what you have here are two droplets that fall. You see that it's growing, then they meet each other, and then they form one big droplet. That means when a surface is already wet, you will always have immediate spreading over this wet surface. So it enhances the spreading. We have also to look, of course, at uh, um, droplets at an angle, and I'll just let you see. So it it's really sticks there. This is due to capillary forces. Then you have here the more hydrophobic contact angle, so there is different than here, and you see how a droplet remains on a, on a surface. Okay. And this is the last one, this was for fun. I asked my student to do a measurement of a, of a textile, and that's what you get. So uh, I showed this uh, movie to people that design textiles, and they were very interested. Because, of course, this is what you don't want to have if, if a policeman, and they throw something to a policeman, that's what you don't want to have. So with that, I finish my presentation. Thank you. <laughs>